and you, you can. are my servant. Okay. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> Hello. And bye -bye. Well, uh, let's start. An anonymous comment reached me through one of our coordinators. And allow me to begin by citing some of the sentences in that comment. The importance of planted forests is not in relation to the area covered. Industrial timber plantations cover only 5% of the global forest area. But these plantations produce 33% of the global roundwood. For the world to be supplied with wood, it needs on a long-term sustainable basis, it needs to invest much more in the development of high yielding short rotation industrial plantations. The alternative is that the world's remaining natural forests will continue to be degraded and or that the pollution from wood substitutes will increase. Thank you. Your comment is very much appreciated. It was an anonymous comment, so I can't thank the person by name. Yes, I agree. Planted forests are very important for the global wood supply. And yes, planted forests can take much of the pressure off the natural forest. In addition, planted forests are often the only feasible option to revegetate denuded and eroded soils. Therefore, this comment is very relevant. However, self-regenerating forests, including novel ecosystems, are also important for a variety of reasons. To sustain the functioning of such self-regenerating forests is a particular challenge for research. Good data are scarce, self-regenerating forests are complex, and the challenges are considerable. But the research also holds great promise because of the sheer magnitude of self-regenerating forests, their great variety, structural complexity, and their important contribution to the global carbon cycle. Whoever you are who wrote the message, thank you very much for this totally appropriate comment. We will use examples of planted forests today and during the field session, the final session. In the final session on 27 April, we will contrast two paradigms of landscape design. The zoning paradigm, which is mainly applied in Canada, uh, and the spatial, small scale spatial mixing paradigm with examples of industrial timber plantations included. Today's session title is Forest Density and Structure. Forest density and structure are part of standard undergraduate courses, so there is much prior knowledge. This allows us to see select aspects that may be new and interesting. The accompanying material includes relevant literature and some applications with R code. Also included is the recorded version of today's presentation. Density and structure have a great effect on the sustainability and functioning of forest ecosystems. The first part of today's session, forest density, includes a brief reference to measures of density. After that, we will pay attention to estimating maximum density in planted and natural forests. The third topic deals with the effect that density has on forest production. In the second part of today's session, we will be looking at forest structure. The structure of a forest community is characterized by the frequency distributions of trees, diameters, and heights, by height growth ordination, which refers to the relationship between the maximum heights and the growth rates of individual species. And finally, we will discuss some aspects of neighborhood methods for analyzing small scale complex forest structures. So let's begin with density. There are 25 trees in each of these two forests, 
but the densities are obviously very different. This simple example shows that number of individuals is unsuitable as a measure of density. The density measures used for grasslands where all individuals have the same size are obviously inadequate for forests. Trees may differ greatly regarding their size. The number of trees is therefore as useful for density estimation as length alone is for estimating area. Just as area is calculated using both length and width, density is a function of at least two variables, the number of trees and their average size. This was explained very clearly by Dr. Boris Zaide. His paper is part of the accompanying material. Common density measures are basal area, relative spacing, crown competition factor, and leaf area index. These are described in standard textbooks, for example, in Modeling Forest Trees and Stands by Harold Burkhardt and Margarita Tomé. And in the fifth edition of Forest Mensuration by John Kershaw and co-authors. You may recall last week's interesting review of 3D remote sensing. Dr. Liang explained the potentials and the limitations of terrestrial laser scanning for assessing details of easy and difficult plots. We learned that it's possible to capture all tree positions and the stem shapes and volumes with acceptable accuracy as well as the terrain features. Of course, it would be nice to capture the live and dead woody biomass, and it would be nice to capture the leaf area. And there's a long wish list, of course, of things that we need to know, especially uh, details about each of the different species. In this particular example, is is easy because we only have three or four species in the boreal forest, but just go down to the tropical, we just go to the south to the tropical forest, then it becomes very, very important uh, that we have accurate identification of individual species and their biomasses and their leaf areas. These details should refer to a plot area. Parts of the crowns of trees located in the plot may extend beyond the plot boundary while crown sections of trees located outside, like in this little tree, for example, or this one, um, may reach into the plot area. A new study by Dr. Klein, who addresses this problem is included in the accompanying material. Measuring density remains to be a challenge, despite much progress in remote sensing. But perhaps an even bigger challenge is to estimate the maximum density of a forest. Maximum forest density is an elusive condition which requires long-term observation. There are no shortcuts. Two standard methods are used to estimate maximum density in forests. We use survival function and self-thinning relations. Survival functions estimate the surviving trees for a specific age. This is age on the x-axis, and that's the proportion of surviving trees on the y-axis. We use the viable function. Uh, normally, the viable function is, read, is uh, written one minus this exponent. Uh, but in this case, it's not one, min one minus, but just the exponent. These functions estimate the surviving trees for a specific age after planting. We use the function to estimate the survival of eucalyptus grandes at different ages. It's a South African spacing experiment. For example, in a very, very dense, dense plot, trees, uh, um, about half of the trees at age 10 
are surviving at age 10, about 50% of the trees at age 10 surviving. Whereas in the sparsely planted plot, all trees or almost all trees are surviving at age 10. This entire slide now shows two popular approaches for estimating maximum densities, tree survival and cell thinning. As explained, models of tree survival estimate the proportion of surviving trees for a specific age after planting and that the parameters of the viable function are determined by the planting density. This graph shows the self-thinning line. Sorry. This shows the self-thinning line for a Pinus Eliotti spacing experiment in South Africa. Trees were planted at high densities, at medium high densities, and at very low densities from 90 trees per hectare to 3,000 trees per hectare. And you can see uh, the, tr the mortality of these trees. They, they grow slower. These grow very much more rapidly. The growth is expressed here in the quadratic mean diameter. Uh, but all reach a magic line. And <laughs> when I first worked with these data, a uh, number of years ago, um, I remember getting goosebumps. You know, goosebumps um, to, to see the magic of the self thinning line uh, that follows a, such a simple mathematical model. This is the mathematical model, where we have, which is defined by two parameters the exponent uh, b uh, by Reinecke was for many years accepted to be minus 1.605, a magic number, but we now know that that parameter can change a lot between species and different sites. It's absolute magic. There is no, there are no surviving trees for a certain uh, mean diameter beyond this line. Dr. Arthur Nielsen, Nielsen of the University of Tartu used another approach to model cell thinning, which he calls sparsity. There's no time now to refer to this. Um, I like to call it Nielsen sparsity, and you will uh, see an example with uh, uh, the R code also how to fit it in the accompanying material. He used the mean distance between the trees instead of the number of trees. So you have uh, quadratic mean diameter and mean distance. They are both measured on the same scale, which has certain advantages. If you want to identify maximum densities in a mixed forest for individual species. Uh, here in the self thinning line, we have number of trees over mean quadratic uh, DBH, and those are different dimensions. So Nielsen's sparsity is quite uh, interesting, and uh, we would need more comparison between the two, uh, some of which I have shown in the accompanying material. Especially the study with Heinz Kotze of uh, South Africa, uh, with whom I have done some work. On, on these maximum densities. Long-term experiments with different initial densities are needed when we want to study survival and cell thinning in planted forests. You know, we need to plant, we need plots that are densely planted and plots that are widely spaced. Uh, and then we observe the development of these plots uh, for many years. But it may also be possible 
to get an estimate of maximum density in a natural forest that has been protected for a long time. The distribution of densities in a natural forest is usually quite irregular. Some quadrats have a high density while there are almost no trees in others. Gaps may occur in close proximity to patches of high density. Therefore, in a natural forest, we may be able to use the same method of estimating maximum density that we use in a planted forest. In a spacing experiment, we have to wait many years for the trees to get big and to reach the maximum density. In a natural forest, we can estimate the maximum density almost instantaneously, provided the forest has been undisturbed for a long time. The graph at left shows the maximum density for a forest planted at different initial densities with one tree species. The graph at right shows the maximum density, the red line, and the minimum density, the blue line, in a large natural forest. Plot Jiaohe, uh, located in northeastern China, uh, covers an area of 30 hectares. 600 meter by 500 meter, all trees are, um, all tree positions are mapped. The site was subdivided into 750 quadrats to establish a self thinning line, each quadrat measuring 20 by 20 meters. The very dense quadrats define the self thinning line. Today, I would do it differently. Instead of subdividing the plot into squares, we can also take a large number of circular plots uh, with the same area, uh, 400 square meters, that we use to subdivide into, into quadrats. Uh, and these would be assigned to random positions, a very large number. That is a more appropriate method, which will be explained in uh, my session on biodiversity in three weeks time. The self-thinning models were all estimated using a percentile uh, regression. And the accompanying material include, includes the publication as well as R code to demonstrate the application for our three uh, observational sites that are permanently part of this workshop. Tree growth and survival, the form formation of tree crowns and root systems are significantly affected by density. So it's only natural that forest density has a great effect on production. We define production as the periodic increase of wood volume or total biomass per unit of time and area. This graph published by Tomasius in 1978, shows the relationship between the average growing space per tree on the axis, x axis, average growing space per tree. So the very dense ones, populations are at left and the open less dense ones at right. Uh, the relation between the average growing space per tree and the total periodic volume production in a 39 year old spruce experiment. Maximum volume production was recorded at the very high density of about 14 square meters growing space per tree. Production drops sharp as forest density decreases. The opposite is true when we consider individual trees. The volume growth of individual trees increases with increasing growing space until a maximum growth rate is reached. After that, a further increase in growing space has no effect. The growth rate remains the same. I like to use the word growth when referring to individual trees and the word production when referring to a forest. Production is affected by density. Growth is affected by competition. 
I've included a manuscript on competition effects that was led by Dr. Thomas Seifert. And uh, that is part of the accompanying material. And it includes that paper is very nice one because it includes a kind of mini review of different approaches to measuring competition. But our focus today is on forest production. Here is some additional evidence from Mexico to show the great effect of forest density on production. The graph shows the linear relation between the initial basal area and the periodic volume increment in the Mexican municipio of San Dimas. Each additional square meter of basal area gains about 0 0.5, 0 0.49, 0 0.5 about half a cubic meter per hectare each year. The Gido La Manga in San Dimas covers an area of 12,000 hectare. Now, we can very nicely see the great <coughs> effect of a density on a large area using this example. For example, if the basal area in San Dimas in La Ejido La Manga uh, was um, 7.5 square meters per hectare, then the total production would be 90,000 cubic meter per year, each year, the total. But if it was, sorry, in the first case, if it was 15 square meter per hectare, the production would be uh, 12,000 times 7.5 is equal to 90,000 cubic meter each year. If the basal area were five square meters more, only five more, then the total production could be estimated at 12,000 times 10 is 120,000 cubic meter each year. That is a considerable dis difference. And I'm sometimes I'm wondering if one could get a model that uh, would um, translate this into world production, into world production and carbon sequestration. But it's uh, too tricky. I think we are lacking too much that there's not sufficient data. Uh, each additional square meter of basal area density has a huge effect on total production much more than biodiversity. The relationship between forest biodiversity and production is highly variable and often very uncertain. The relationship between forest density and production is straightforward in planted forests as well as self-regenerating forests. That particular study is also part of the accompanying material. Increasing low forest densities to productive densities is a worthwhile investment, but it can take much time to raise densities and from the low level to, to a level for satisfactory production. It's a, it's a huge problem in many uh, regions. Well, that was a brief introduction to forest density. How to measure density is uh, common knowledge, but maximum density is quite elusive. And density of production, I think we need to emphasize the enormous effect of density on forest production. It's not so widely known, uh, seems to me. We're now coming to the second part of today's session, forest structure. Structure is a fundamental notion referring to patterns and relationships within a well-defined system. The structure of a planted forest is characterized by one species, one tree size, and a regular distribution of planting positions. The structure of a self-regenerating forest, and please allow me to use, I like the 
the word self-regenerating forest because natural is just a natural forest, but self-regenerating for, uh, regenerating forests are communities that consist of uh, tree species that have always been there and invaded species. So self-regenerating forest is a more uh, a general term that refers to these complex systems, complex multi-species communities. Well, the structure of a self-regenerative forest is defined by several species, variable tree sizes, and a complex spatial pattern of densities and competition. A first step in analyzing forest structure is to study the distribution of tree diameters and heights. There are some typical distribution shapes that reveal the structure of a forest. Diameter distributions are often left skewed like this example. Height distribution are often right skewed, especially when the species is light demanding. Bimodal distributions are also quite common, both for diameters and heights. A bimodal distribution indicates that there are two layers, a canopy layer and a subcanopy layer. The graph at left, at the lower left, this one, refers to a forest with a few large sea trees, perhaps large sea trees, and a big population of juveniles. And the bimodal distribution, this one, uh, at right, may be found in natural forests with a closed canopy and a sparse population of juveniles that are shaded out. These distributions refer now to the accompanying material that you can look at at your own time. This is a viable distribution fitted to all the trees in the Mexican plot La Victoria. The data set and the R code are part of the accompanying material. The distribution of tree heights in La Victoria is bimodal. As mentioned before, the bimodal height distribution indicates a structure with a distinct canopy layer and a subcanopy layer. That structure is typical for many self regenerating forests. The accompanying material includes the details for each of the three example plots with the R code. We're using the library MCLUST, the R library MCLUST. About 25 years ago, Dr. Tevari, a physicist from the Indian Council of Forest Research and Education, started to work on bivariate distributions in our institute. The results were so interesting that we followed up with several other studies on bivariates. The graph shows quite clearly the distinction between two subpopulations. This little mountain and this bigger mountain, two subpopulations for one species, beech tree. The diameter height relation of the canopy trees and that of the subcanopy trees. The regression slope of the subcanopy trees is much steeper. I think you can see that very easily, much steeper than the regression slope of the canopy trees. A small change in diameter brings a big change in height. The subcanopy trees need to invest more in height growth than the canopy trees, which already have full access to sunlight. This graph uh, is known as a perspective plot. Bivariates may also be presented in this shape, which shows the variability of heights for a given DBH. We fitted bivariates to Quercus cytoroxala and Pinus cooperi in the Mexican plot of the accompanying material. 
this is perhaps a nice picture to look at, but it has also practical implications. The bivariate approach allows us to estimate the diameter or the height that separates mature and immature individuals of canopy species. We have published lists of segregating diameters for different species. The paper is also part of the accompanying material. Right. This is for an individual species, and this would be the segregating DBH, the segregate diameter when we want to structure a complex forest, make it simple, then it is useful to identify mature and immature individuals of the same, of a one particular species. And uh, we found it's quite useful to use bivariates for this purpose. The distribution of the physical properties of trees is a good start. But what about the biological properties of the different tree species? Some species are shade tolerant and slow growing. Others are shade tolerant and fast growing. Some are potential. Hello. <laughs> uh, some are potentially dominant. Others are permanent subcanopy specialists. We can use a method called height growth ordination to identify typical species cohorts. A cohort is a group of species with similar attributes. And uh, even if, it, if the attributes are more enduring, then we talk about similar traits, groups that share the same characteristics. This graph shows the mean heights and the average diameter growth rates of 33 tree species in a Mexican forest for which at least 20 remeasurements are available. This purple egg-shaped region at right shows the height growth ordination for a group of dominant species. These are mostly pines and other conifers. Uh, you see that these with a P is always a pine and ABS, there's an ABS that is very dominant in the PCR, a rare species of PCR in Mexico that is uh, really uh, um, extremely dominant. And we have another group uh, uh, of species, which is in this orange colored area. Uh, they are fast growing sub canopy species, arbutos, mainly arbutos, different species of arbutos, very fast growing, uh, but they are sub canopy specialists. And then also some quercus, some oaks uh, belong to this one. And then we have a third group, the, they are almost entirely. Uh, all of them are, are oaks. There's a juniperus also included in this group. This kind of ordination is very helpful in structuring a multi-species forest communities. Mean height or top height even, uh, we didn't have so good results with the top height. That's why we use the mean height. And then the growth, the growth of the individuals. Uh, this helps us to better understand the biological structure of a specific forest ecosystem. Dr. Chon Luhan is the lead author in a study that is included for download. The paper explains the method in more detail. Finally, when talking about forest structure, we should take note of methods for analyzing the close range neighborhoods of particular trees. Neighborhood methods include a growing body of research that has aroused much interest within the scientific community. These methods are based on the premise that a forest consists of a mosaic of neighborhoods and that each neighborhood has a particular species composition 
spatial pattern and size distribution. Neighborhood methods have important advantage over classical spatial statistics, including low cost field assessment and cohort specific structural analysis. Dr. Hui Ganjing and Dr. Anne Pomerening have done much work in this important area of research. The graph shows a neighborhood group of five trees, a reference tree in the middle and its four nearest neighbors. The colors indicate different species. If we define mingling as the proportion of neighbors of a given reference tree that belongs to a different species, then uh, we get five different constellations. All species are the same, none is different from the reference tree, so the mingling value would be zero. One is different, one divided by four, and the mingling value would be 0.25, or three out of the four neighbors uh, are different from that particular species, only one is the same. So we get a mingling value of 0.75. Very simple, but very interesting because there's lots of things you can do with this. More details in the relevant R code are included in the accompanying material. We don't need to uh, define a reference tree, but we can define a reference point, a coordinate uh, within the forest and study uh, the neighborhood group around that point uh, or within a circle of a given radius and a variable number of um, trees, variable number of individuals within a fixed radius circle or a fixed number of individuals uh, within a group of four as I explained here. This is the graph of the plot Germany 111, uh, which is part of the accompanying material. The plot includes three species. Red is Quercus robur, blue is Fagus sylvatica, and green is Carpinus betulus, three different species. We have selected a cohort of reference trees that includes all Quercus robur with a minimum DBH of 80 centimeter that are located at a certain minimum distance from the plot border. This leaves us with five neighborhood groups for the big Quercus robo. Four of the five groups have the mingling value of one. You know, the neighbors are all different species. They are blue ones, the reference tree is red, so they have a mingling value of one. But this one is different. Two are the same species, two of the nearest neighbors are Quercus and two are others. So the mingling value is 0.5. Neighborhood methods are very flexible. We may distinguish species cohorts, gender cohorts, males and female individuals of dioecious species, for example, in size cohorts, large or small individuals of a particular species. A cohort of reference trees may also be defined by specific combinations of gender, species, and size. For example, we may be interested to study the neighborhoods of all female Fraxinus manchurica that are dominant and compare the results with all Fraxinus manchurica males that are subdominant. Neighborhood methods provide us with useful information about current conditions and long-term changes, including the effect of particular disturbances. Uh, in three weeks time, uh, I will present uh, a session on diversity and we will come back to this problem, but uh, with in a, di in a different perspective. That was an introduction to forest density and structure. A very brief introduction. Both density and structure have a significant effect on the sustainability 
and functioning of the forest ecosystem. A narrated version will soon be available for download. I think it is already. You are welcome to use the recorded version at your discretion. Actually, the, I'm using the PPSX. Normally we use the PowerPoint PPTX, but the PPSX has certain advantages. You can page backwards and forwards and repeat one slide. You can, you can listen to one particular slide several times. Next week, Dr. Zhang Chunyu will present his research on beta diversity. Dr. Zhang is a leading expert in that field and his contribution promises to be highly relevant and interesting. Science is not divided by national borders. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening. So I can close it or maybe there are questions um, to certain slides, so I'll leave it open, okay? Yeah, yeah. well, I, I know sure that, uh, that I have to do. <laughs> uh, I represent uh, the Universidad Austral de Chile. Uh, but uh, I Alicia. think- Alicia, Al yes. I, <laughs> We know each other. I, I think we have met many years ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and I have to moderate this uh, this part. Uh, you have to make some question in the chat. Yes, it's right. I, I don't see any any question. Uh, I, wait, how can I see the question? Uh, can you help me? I want to see the questions. Wait. Uh, I see the chat, but uh, not the question. Uh, not uh, mm -hmm. Good. Well, in, uh, well uh, in that case, I, I have a question. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, in natural forest, yeah, it's, uh, it's very difficult to measure the height, okay? The total height. Uh, mm -hmm. in, the, in this case of these studies, uh, normally uh, the, all the tree heights are measured or sample. Oh, yeah. Uh, your question is... Oh. Yes, yes. Uh, maybe uh, to avoid the, uh, the measuring heights is costly. So you want to uh, reduce height measurements as much as possible. I can remember that uh, in India, we measure many, many field plots in India. And there's also a mixed plot with very uneven, it's a very uneven age with the different heights. So. Uh, the field crews are normally very experienced. They selected some heights and measured them accurately. And then the trees uh, near the measured ones, they estimated the heights. Uh, okay. We did a study uh, some years ago, classifying the heights into three meter and five meter categories, three meter intervals. You know, it's within that three meter or within that five meter interval. And actually the results, if you measure lots of, of heights, the results are very similar to, uh, to a fully measured um, height distribution. It's very interesting. And I think it's worthwhile doing such studies, very worthwhile. Of course, uh, uh, Dr. Liang last week, he, he uh, told us that uh, remote sensing will very soon make manual height measurements obsolete so that they will be able to assess everything uh, without us having to use long rods and uh, the uh, hypsometers. Yeah. 
Did that <clears throat> answer your question? Some question? Uh, so, Ricardo, no, Shkar, I am Vipi Oh, in the chat? Hmm? I am VP Tiwari. I am VP Tiwari from India. Are you listening to me? Yes, yeah. I hear you. Professor yeah. Ricardo, there is, there, is no, there is no question, but just some query. I, I cannot ask questions with Professor Ricardo. I have worked mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. And my question is that suppose we have different fertility, fertility level. Even for, for the same species, we have different type of fertility level. So whether this self cell line will differ with the fertility level. The I'm level. Talking, talking about the level of fertility. Fertility. F fertility. Facility. Soil fertility. Soil fertility, yes. So if the fertility level is different, whether the self cell line will be different, the slope slope will be different for the same species, or it will be constant. So we have the foundation of the same species at different fertility level, and we want to draw the self same line. So whether we will get the same self same line, or the slope of the self same line will different for the different fertility level. That is my query. The we have different type of soil fertility. So mm -hmm. I am talking about the slope of the sulfuring line. Whether it will be same or slope will vary with the fertility level of the soil. Are you referring to the bivariate? C can you understand? No. Uh, no, no, I am telling about the fertility. Uh, are you referring to bivariate distribution? I am talking about the density. The density. Uh -huh. No, I am referring oh, to your density. density. Uh -huh. Dr. Tiwari was uh, addressing the self thinning line and the different site indexes or different fertility classes. Yeah. Okay, thanks very so much. I am talking so about the slope of the self thinning. Whether it will be, suppose we have low fertility level, so slope will be flatter or it will be steep or it will remain same. In, in the log, you, you know, if we have a log transformation of both variables, the DQ and the number of trees, uh, then we get a, a line with a slope. And the slope is very different for different situations. Uh, that is my experience. So the magic line, the magic slope of 1.605 that was uh, found by Reinecke, uh, in a way, it's a kind of average that, if I remember correctly, it was a kind of average for Douglas fir in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. And I think there have been several studies, a number of studies that have found slopes uh, of minus two, 2.3, uh, down to 1.5, 1.4. So there's a great variability of slopes and the slope uh, needs to be identified to make um, uh, to, to make good guesses of maximum density. Uh, we cannot, and that's why certain uh, density measures that are based on the assumption that this slope is fixed slope and always occurs, you know, minus 1.605, uh, 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 be very careful. We should be very careful in using that. Did that answer Actually, your question? My understanding about this self thinning is that self thinning is a dynamic dynamic process between stand growth and mortality. And I understand yes. this self thinning is a process which is a dynamic process between stand growth and mortality. But generally, we are driving self thinning line using side density data, side density data static data. So why we are not using the dynamic models or the mortality model? Most of the time I am finding that people are driving the self lines using only size and density data, which is static. But when process is dynamic, 
then why not uh, we are using the modality model or other dynamic models to have a better uh, perception about the self thing lines what is your opinion uh, are you referring to planted forests or to natural forests there's a big i'm difference. referring to the planted forest planted forest planted forest generally we draw self thing line using the size density data mm -hmm. and their size density data is a static figure but mm -hmm. i perceive that self thinning is a dynamic process between stand growth and mortality so why not we should draw the self thinning line using the simple mortality model or other kind of dynamic model instead of only size and density data well, so, wh what do you think what is your suggestion well that sounds like a good idea if you there are approaches to mortality estimates but uh, uh, well i think uh, um, why don't we discuss it in uh, why don't we exchange the emails or a data set or different data sets yeah yeah yes, i wanted your... to have you yeah that we can do but it's just i wanted to know your idea about this what do you think that's all in the planted forest we, we have much experience. No in planted forest we have much experience with uh, at least uh, from south african uh, cct studies uh, but in natural oh. forests not so much not so not so because it depends you know the mortality rates are different depending on whether you are shade tolerant plant uh, species or whether you have fast growing light demanding species so the biological composition, I would guess, of a natural forest or of a self-regenerating forest that uh, co may consist of uh, uh, native species and invading acacias from Australia, for example, um, which I think uh, is a, it, they are ecosystems uh, that are not sufficiently researched yet but are gaining in importance more and more. And in your country as well, I think. Uh, well, yeah, thank, you, sir. A, thank you, sir. It's an interesting <laughs> uh, question. And I think we need some hard data and find out uh, um, how to approach this problem uh, in specific cases. Um, I can't see a general answer to this. Now. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. You are welcome, sir. There are some uh, questions in uh, in the chat. I can read uh, from Jam Bahadur. Uh, how we can apply potential forecast model to assess human use impact on forests under different uh, different socioeconomic variable. Thank the you. Yeah. yeah, that is uh, Yam Bahadur, no? Uh -huh. Thank you, sir. Yes, I, I can see you there. I can see you. Thank you for your question. Uh, potential forecast model to assess human use impact on forests under different socioeconomic variables. Not my ex expertise, but I know it's very important. I know there is a lot of pressure uh, on this, and it, it's a policy um, social thing. And um, I'm not sure if you can work with questionnaires. Um, I think there are different uh, ways, but I'm not familiar with these methods. I'm not familiar. Uh, for example, um, it's a volatile. You see, when we work with trees and uh, biosystems, it's uh, it's hard data, and we can make our uh, conclusions. But uh, as soon as we have social systems, uh, including, uh, it becomes volatile. It becomes very difficult. Uh, I, I think that uh, Dr. Seifert has an answer to this. I'm not sure whether I have an answer, but if we look uh, at the response variables we're looking at, what does human impact change in our forest structure? We might find a lever 
to explain human impact or at least means of researching it also without socioeconomic uh, being socioeconomists uh, because uh, what uh, you can see is of course a distance to a settlement influences wood density because people clear around villages for firewood for example so the forest density is a very important thing also the frequency of fires is a thing that you could look into if you look want to see how um, population structures interact with forests. So that can be done, for example, by uh, different inventory methods, transect methods or drone studies, where you look into the different uh, forest densities, because there is usually a typical density influence on settlements in a lot of countries. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bahadur, did this answer your question? Yeah, Thomas, I see you have a question here. Why not use drone or terrestrial laser scanning methods? What's more recommend? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, uh, that was a presentation uh, last week's presentation was about this and the promises are enormous, but the limitations are also uh, still quite tricky, but it's a very fast moving area of research. And uh, maybe I can recommend that you uh, look at the literature that accompanied that presentation it was an excellent presentation by Dr. Liang from Finland. I will so definitely no look that up. It's, it's the future, Thomas. This is, uh, there is no doubt about that. I think uh, machine learning and these technologies are, have a great potential. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, I mean, Seki uh, Baskin said, yeah. have you experienced the self feeling low in any density for, of plantation? Yes, uh, uh, Dr. Baskent from Turkey. I cannot see you, but thank you very much for your question. Yes, one of the slides showed the self thinning line and in contrast with the survival model. So if you look at my lecture again on, uh, at your leisure, you will see the self thinning was explained and it was for Pinos Iliote plantations, but we have similar results for different species. Yeah, but it's always one species for the self thinning line, one species. And in, the, in the natural forest, we assume a stable community, a stable mix of species and that has been protected for a long period of time. And then we can use the same approach. Uh, Dr. Baskent, did I? Oh, he has to leave. I have, oh. to, leave. Yeah. I, I have to leave. I have another, another uh, session. Uh, thank you very much, Kadu. It was a nice presentation. Okay. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> nice to see you too. <laughs> I mean, <Zeki>, huh? <laughs> Okay. Um, nice to see you. Uh, I, I'll watch um, uh, uh, in the next sessions. Okay. In the next coming week. Okay. We'll okay. be together. Okay. okay. Bye bye. Good luck. Bye bye. bye. You too. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, I have a question. Uh, the, we are just in time, but uh, it's a little question uh, about the uh, natural forest. Uh, you recommend major of all the trees, independent uh, the species, uh, but this thinking in management uh, in the future. I say um, a natural forest uh, in Chile, especially, and, and a lot of countries, but uh, we have a, a, a type, forest type, yeah, uh, to be managing, managing. Mm -hmm. And uh, you recommend measure all the species or just the main species? Is that that is your uh, question specifically to Notofagos forest? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I've been in Chile uh, once or twice and uh, amazing 
marvelous forest that you have, the Notophagus forest. And of course, management, the management of these systems is quite a different, uh, uh, different problem. So yeah. um, I think to develop management systems, if you have the time, try and come to our final session on 27 April. I will introduce a method for managing a natural forests that is based on um, first to subdivide the complex community, which consists of many species to simplify that. And once we simplify that, then uh, we use an approach that's based on residual basal areas for each that you do not disturb the natural balance. Uh, uh, you can define certain species groups and their minimum basal areas and anything that exceeds uh, those minimum basal areas can be harvested. Quite in contrary, this approach is in contrast to methods where we define the harvest. You know, in plantation forests, we normally say how much must be harvested. But in uh, natural forest, it is more appropriate to define how much must remain after the harvest. You know, when you harvest, how much must remain? And the specific techniques on how to define residual structures in complex forests, I will introduce uh, on 27 April. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Any <laughs> other question? No, I think uh, I no. can see. I can see. Uh, I can see here. One no. uh, question: How to compare? Thanks for you. Oh, okay. Uh, Mr. Oh, Mrs. I don't know. Uh, one cent. Question yeah. from that. I can see that. How to yeah. compare the density uh, between a natural forest and a planted forest? How to compare the density between a natural forest and a planted forest? <laughs> this is too difficult for me. <laughs> but I have uh, one comment. Uh, that we can we if we know the self thinning line and you see in the paper with dr Zhang that is part of the accompanying material we compared a planted forest with a natural forest uh, through the self thinning line using the method that i explained just now in the low diameters, the planted forest had a higher density. In the high diameters, when we considered the high diameters, the big diameters, then the natural forest had a higher number of surviving trees. But that was just one example that I remember. I'm not sure if there are any studies. Uh, one should compare many plantations and many natural forests to be able to draw general conclusions. But you can see this one example, it even shows a picture with the two self-thinning lines of the natural forest and the plantation in uh, um, Zhang Chunyu's paper. That is part of the accompanying material. So in, uh, for us, it was interesting to see a uh, self thinning line with different slopes and a much higher density in uh, low diameter classes for the plantation and much higher density in the high diameter classes for the natural forest in a nutshell. Okay. Many, um, I there is another another question uh, from uh, Mr. Wansen. Uh, what do you think about the relationship between max mai 
and max density in a span. Is the my optimal when the density is max? Uh, from NASAT. Wait. Yeah. This is from NASAT, no? What do you yes. think about yeah. the relationship between maximum MAI and max density in a stand? Uh, is the MAI optimum when the density is max? Uh, yes. Um, I think that uh, re the answer is uh, quite clear uh, in so far as uh, greater densities will produce greater biomass per unit of time and area, but to a certain extent. Uh, there's much uncertainty and there's a paper by Harold Burker that was recently published. Uh, we know uh, that the effect of density on production is very strong up to a certain uh, limit. And then we don't know whether the Langsetta model works or the Asman model works where we have a, a, a maximum, a sharp maximum, or whether we have a long plateau of maximum density before the combined approach of mortality and a re reduced um, uh, vitality produces a decline again. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I think there are different hypotheses and we can only use individual case studies to show that uh, for a particular case study it works like this. And then of course we need to know the maximum density and that is very elusive. Maximum density is very, very elusive. Um, so I think the more the merrier, the more dense the higher is the pro production. And the MAI, mean annual increment per area and time, the mean annual is production. That is volume production, the unit of area and time. No? And that is affected by density. And it's quite clear that the highest density will give the highest production. There is a small piece of doubt a small piece of doubt that uh, beyond the maximum density, beyond the maximum live uh, biomass uh, that can be sustained in a natural forest system, what happens? I think there is some doubt unless, uh, Thomas, do you perhaps have an idea? Uh, do you have an idea or anybody else? Uh, yeah, Lee Wukian has a question. Yeah, it's a very interesting case. Thank you very much for your good, uh, interesting uh, the lectures. The, this question is very interesting. Uh, I'm not sure if there is uh, the relationship between mean annual increment and maximum density, but as I know, uh, we need to think of the motion turbine volume in relation to this this uh, the question. Then, uh, even if uh, um, we can get the max mean annual increments uh, optimum or maximum through maximum density, that it doesn't uh, bring us uh, the optimum motion turbine volume, I think. So then I don't think the maximum density bring us the optimal uh, mean annual increment, a maximum annual increment. Yeah, that uh, is the assumption that if you remember the curve by Tomasius that I showed, this, this curve of the relationship between uh, density and production, it showed that the maximum production occurred <laughs> a little bit to the right of the maximum density. Huh? Uh, that agrees with what you said now, just now. Well, I think that uh, no more question and we're in time. Uh, a comment. Uh, 
and uh, uh, we are ten, 10 minutes more than time and some person has delivered the meeting. So I think that is, is right, is okay. Um, I don't know the, the, the who is the person who closed the, this, this uh, session. I'm not, I, I think. <laughs> I, I think, thank you very much, Alicia, for uh, sharing the session and for organizing the question and answers. Uh, I would just like to thank everybody for coming and attending uh, this session, which I think is very important. But next week, uh, there will be a presentation on beta diversity by one of the leading experts on this very important field. And I look forward to attending the session. I hope uh, you have the time uh, also to be with us and join us. Thank you very much, Alicia and Huang Ren. Thank you. Thank you. See you next week. Thank you. See you. Bye. 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 Nice to see you, Klaus. Yeah, <laughs> okay. uh, say, say hi to uh, uh, Guillermo, please. Guillermo Trincado, yeah. please give my uh, regards for him. Okay, I say. Thank you. Who is that? Okay. Is that Th thanks, Julian. Thanks, Julian. Thank you, Professor Gardo. Very, very nice presentation. Very interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you for your <laughs> difficult <laughs> question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Okay. Ah, oh, madam. Hello, madam. How are you? Are you <laughs> Thank in, you, sir. I couldn't you ask Carol? any question because you the Carol? topic you are discussing is so complicated uh, subject. Oh. We cannot understand fully. <laughs> so I couldn't. Oh, oh madam. <laughs> Please give my regards to your husband. Question. Hope it will be all cleared by the time. Ah, oh, yes, sir. <laughs> Good night, okay. sir. Thank you so much. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. Bye bye. bye. So, uh, who is that, Shinya? Yes, I'm here. I, I was <laughs> thinking, <laughs> thinking, thinking about the last question <laughs> that you, you, you were everybody discussing. Wants, about. Everybody yeah. wants your greedy remote sensor. <laughs> 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 Everybody in, in, interesting in, in this. Yeah, <laughs> in this, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. I, I, actually, I, I didn't want to interrupt uh, because there are so many interesting questions. Actually, mm -hmm. about this, uh, about this uh, uh, density, about the production. Yeah. How, 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 how to define the production? I think, I think there, there, there must be a de definition there for the production. Mm -hmm. So be... it's like the annual increase of volume, the biomass, probably. Well, uh, the, there are different uh, variables that can express production. Of course, for the people interested in money, mm. it's a stem volume that's utilizable and perhaps the stem volume of a certain minimum uh, diameter. Uh, for the ecologist, it would be the biomass, mm. the live biomass. Uh, distributed over stems, branches, and leaves. Mm. Uh, and for others, it would be simply the total wood volume, mm. the total wood volume uh, per unit area and time, or per unit area and time as production. So different ways to express production. And it's always per area, in time, because then it's comparable anywhere to any other place. And, and, and this uh, maximum density will increase the production. Yeah. Is it production actually refers here to any production or just a particular kind of production? The data that we have yeah. refer to total timber volume production, okay. the data that we have. Yeah. Uh, of course, we can estimate the biomass once we have the volumes, the timber volumes. There are expansions, biomass expansion factors 
but uh, the raw data that we have only refer to timber volume okay. that are accessible to me. Yeah. Uh, and I, the, I, 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 yeah, please, mm. please. No, no, you, you, please, you ask. Well, I, I was just, uh, I remember that Professor Lee actually come up a comment that, that I, I do not catch that very clearly that uh, what's that comment. Yeah. So when, when, when the export density is uh, not, not, not necessary in increase uh, I think Professor Lee wanted to say that production is not maximum at the highest possible density. Because can you remember that curve that I showed from Tomasius, that curve yeah. where production is very high mm -hmm. uh, at a very high density of 14 square meters um, uh, growing space per tree mm -hmm. is the highest, but to the left, there was even, you know, it's only half a square meter per tree or one square meter per tree. Um, mm. Then I think there is also a lack of data. There's a lack of data because uh, trees are not planted so closely and you rarely find them in a, in a forest so closely. Uh, it's, as I said, maximum density is an elusive what is another word for elusive? It's maximum density is very, very difficult to assess. We can approximate mm. it, but it mm. is extremely difficult to assess it accurately for one reason. Because as we found in plantation, planted forest, it bounces back. You know, you have plots that reach a very high density but then in five years time, there's a crash and all the trees are dying. Not all of them, mm. but many trees are dying. So mm. it's, it's an oscillating relationship. It's oscillating. It comes to that wall, which mm. is maximum density or self thinning And then uh, after that, you may find that there's a crash phase where many trees will die because mm. Uh, of the high density. Yeah. So it's not a continuous process. It's not a stable process. Everything is moving. Everything is uh, changing all the time. Trees die, de trees regenerate and so on. And that elusive condition of maximum density, you find at one particular place, one particular point in time but it may change. But what we know is very robust. We know that the higher the density, the greater is the production. And I think that is something for people to realize because density has a much greater effect than biodiversity on production. Yeah. Density is the real motor of production. If we have 12 trees in one forest and three trees in the other forest, these three trees must pro produce four times as much volume to be equal with the 12 trees in the other forest. Yeah. And that's impossible. You cannot, the, the highest uh, ratio between free growing trees that have no competition and very, very densely spaced trees in diameter growth is about twice, not more. You know, if you have one tree there and you have 12 trees, that one tree must produce 12 times the volume of those mm. 12 trees. Mm. Uh, it's, a bit, it's a bit simple, but it shows quite clearly, I think, uh, 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 the relation the effect of density. Yeah. The other thing is about, about the time, the time framework that, for example, if there's like 12 trees in one plot and three trees in the other, that let's say that if we think about there's a wall, a density wall there. So and we know that before, before the density reach or 
the, the, the productivity reach that wall. So this uh, dense forest actually produces <laughs> more. But how about like when the when when the density has already reached the wall, so it, it start to decline. So in that not case, much. it is not much. It, not not much. Okay. Mm, not much. It oscillates. You know, it's a discontinuous process. It doesn't stay yeah. there. Mm. It needs, you know, because some trees are still growing. And, yeah. uh, so some trees need to die uh, yeah. if it wants to stay at that uh, density. It's, it's almost a philosophical question, this maximum density. And one has to have, it's very site specific. Mm -hmm. uh, we studied the soil types and the rainfall and the altitude uh, of these different plots. And we found that cell thinning, you can see some of it in the accompanying material. Mm -hmm. uh, we could see that the cell thinning line slopes and intercept. The intercept actually is the important one. If you have a log log scale, the intercept defines the maximum density if the slopes are the same. Um, we found uh, that site type, soil type, and rainfall and altitude in the same species have a modifying effect on the self thinning line. But okay. such data where you have observed trees from planting 60 years after are very mm. rare in this world. Very, yeah. very seldom. Yeah. You know, who today nobody would probably make do the go to the trouble to to do this anymore. Mm. <laughs> the other question related to this: do, do, do you know any other country have the similar long time uh, time series plot as Germany has? The Germany, the, uh, the, the best plots for self thinning are South African plots, South Africa, now okay. fake. The uh, Germany plots uh, were established long time ago. Mm. The oldest ones uh, about now 130 years ago were established and then regularly. But these plots were thinned, they were treated mm. uh, without replication. So the value of these plots is mostly in um, studying effects of climate change and pollution, but not so much about density, maximum density. You know, the European plots were uh, very often uh, management plots. But the South African ones are research plots and enormous, an enormous uh, quantity of data over different sites with many replications uh, and planting densities ranging from very, very low density to very, very high density. Uh, they, they did this and I don't know any equivalent in the world that has done this, that has done something like this. Is it is South African plot is like, like a national project. So they are going to maintain it like this. Or... Unfortunately, uh, they, um, when the trees reached an age, you know, mm. these plantation trees are very fast growing. So yeah. they don't yeah. live very long. Okay. okay. When the, when the plots started to disintegrate, mm. that would have been for me a most interesting phase to carry on observing. Are there some trees that are still surviving? Mm. What happens uh, then? Uh, are there invasive species coming into that plot? That's mm -hmm. now uh, being, unfortunately, the land, of course, is expensive. So they had to, uh, they had to make use of that land for other purposes. And the plots were discontinued, um, unfortunately, for research. 
but that's the necessity of life. Yeah, yeah it's very, very expensive to maintain the, 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 that plot for a long time. Yeah. It would be marvelous if we had your methods. I mean, the species identification, I can see that it will take some time. But mm -hmm. you, if you know, picture this, mm -hmm. this is what made for garden species. Mm -hmm. I can identify most species. You know, I walk along in the garden and outside in the fields and picture this is excellent, a wonderful tool. But in trees, to identify a tree, you cannot take a photo of the leaves because they are high up. So yes. if you want to, to develop um, machine learning for tree identification, you also have to consider bark. Mm -hmm. The bark yeah. tells you a lot about a tree species. From the outside, the yes. bark is different at different times of the year. But also, uh, if you cut into the bark, and I had to learn the hard way in, in some uh, tropical forest, um, the bark smells, there are certain smells of the bark. Mm. Some smell like almond, some mm. bark smell like citrus. And the bark is an indicator if you don't have the access to the flowers or the leaves. And then um, the coloring, the coloring under the bark is also interesting. Well, we're talking away now. Kuang Jen needs to go to, to bed because it is uh, very late. Kuang Jen, yes, sorry yes. for keeping you awake so long. Oh. <laughs> yes, Kuang Jen, please go home. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm very because of the, no 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 yeah. it's, <laughs> the, the, the scientific question we discussed is so moving so that the <laughs> yeah. start <to> crying <laughs> she, 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 she is a forest lover so that she started crying <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. oh yeah mm -hmm. okay. so all, almost all the flowers started to open so i have some you know oh yeah 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 in spring oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay good shall we call it a day thank you very much for your questions yes. attendance thank you very much and remember next week john uh, trinity is really very very uh, good with uh, beta diversity excellent mm -hmm. Okay, thank okay. you. One and See you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye. Uh.